The great and crowning advent of the Lord will be subsequent to these two appearances, to the New Jerusalem and to the Jews, but who can describe it in the language of mortals? The tongue of man falters, and the pen drops from the hand of the writer as the mind is wrapped in contemplation of the sublime and awful majesty of his coming to take vengeance on the ungodly and to reign as king of the whole earth. He comes, the earth shakes, and the tall mountains tremble. The mighty deep rolls back to the north as in fear, and the rent skies glow like molten brass. He comes, the dead saints burst forth from their tombs, and those who are alive and remain are caught up with them to meet him. The ungodly rush to hide themselves from his presence and call upon the quivering rocks to cover them. He comes with all the hosts of the righteous glorified. The breath of his lips strikes death to the wicked. His glory is a consuming fire. The proud and the rebellious are as stubble. They are burned and left neither root nor branch. He sweeps the earth as with the besom of destruction. He deluges the earth with the fiery floods of his wrath and the filthiness and abominations of the world are consumed. Satan and his dark hosts are taken and bound. The prince of the power of the air has lost his dominion. For he whose right it is to reign has come and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's from President Charles W. Penrose uh, of the First Presidency uh, back in the early 1900s. Welcome to On Fire. This is the On Fire podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Allen. This is part three of, uh, of the series, What is the Second Coming? Some people imagine that they will be living a normal life, maybe shopping at Walmart or in, in their high-rise office monitoring the stock market. And lo, the sound of trumpets and uh, the heavens open and the Savior descends in clouds of glory and the second coming is upon them. If that's what you have imagined, please go back and listen to parts one and two of this series, What is the Second Coming? You will probably find that the earth itself and the society of those who have survived will be drastically different than they are right now. Natural disasters, perhaps the greatest of which will be the great worldwide earthquake that occurs as the Savior sets his feet upon the Mount of Olives, will, will change and alter the landscape of the whole earth. Mountains will become valleys and, and vice versa. Uh, bodies of water will be relocated. Widespread war and calamity will claim billions of lives, and the Earth's population will be a fraction of what it is today. In the process of all of these events, many faithful saints will be called upon to pass into the spirit world, and their work will continue there for a short time until the Savior comes and they are resurrected. The prophet Joseph Smith said this, quote, I explained concerning the coming of the Son of Man, also that it is a false idea that the saints will escape all the judgments whilst the wicked suffer. For all flesh is subject, is subject to suffer, and the righteous shall hardly escape. Still many of the saints will escape, for the just shall live by faith. Yet many of the righteous shall fall prey to disease, to pestilence, etc., by reason of the weakness of the flesh, and yet be saved in the kingdom of God, so that it is an unhallowed principle to say that such and such have transgressed because they have been preyed upon by disease or death. For all flesh is subject to death. And the Savior has said, judge not, lest ye be judged. All right, we talked in part two of this series about Christ coming to the Jews at Jerusalem. Joseph Smith taught the following about Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Quote, Judah must return. Jerusalem must be rebuilt and the temple. And water come out from under the temple. And the waters of the Dead Sea be healed. I love, I love that idea. That's, that's amazing. If you have seen the Dead Sea or even the Great Salt Lake, if you can imagine uh, a body of water like that um, be, be healed and have the waters be fresh and clear and, and have fish living in, in there and, and, uh, and vegetation around it uh, will be miraculous. But the water that comes out from under the temple uh, is a representation of Christ who will be living waters and will heal uh, the Dead Sea. Back to Joseph Smith's quote. 
It will take some time to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple, etc. And all this must be done before the Son of Man will make his appearance. There will be wars and rumors of wars, signs in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, the sun turned into darkness and the moon to blood, earthquakes in diverse places, the seas heaving beyond their bounds. Then will appear one grand sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But what will the world do? They will say it is a planet, a comet, etc. But the Son of Man will come as, a, as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which will be as the light of the morning cometh out of the east. Close quote. In section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord describes his coming in glory this way, starting in verse 39. And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come, even for the signs of the, of the coming of the Son of Man. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. And they shall behold blood and fire and vapors of smoke. And before the day of the Lord shall come, the sun be, shall be darkened and the moon be turned into blood and the stars fall from heaven and the remnant shall be gathered unto this place. And then they shall look for me and behold, I will come and they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory with all the holy angels. And he that watches not for me shall be cut off. But before the arm of the Lord shall fall, an angel shall sound his trump, and the saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. Wherefore, if ye have slept in peace, blessed are you. For as you now behold me and know that I am, even so shall ye come unto me, and your souls shall live, and your redemption shall be perfected, and the saints shall come forth from the four quarters of the earth. Then shall the arm of the Lord fall upon the nations, and then shall the Lord set his foot upon this mount, and it shall cleave in twain. And the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake. And the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. And the nations of the earth shall mourn, and they that have laughed shall see their folly. And calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorner shall be consumed. And they that have watched for iniquity shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. That's the end of that scripture. So if you haven't gathered... Uh, gathered this yet, we are talking about the second coming, the Savior's coming in glory to the whole earth uh, that follows his preliminary appearances that we've discussed previously. Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said this in his April 2015 General Conference talk. We live, brothers and sisters, in the, day, in the days preceding the Lord's second coming a time long anticipated by believers through the ages. We live in days of wars and rumors of wars, days of natural disasters, days when the world is pulled by confusion and commotion. But we also live in the glorious time of the restoration, when the gospel is being taken to all the world, a time when the Lord has promised that he will raise up a pure people and arm them with righteousness and with the power of God. Our faith grows as we anticipate the glorious day of the Savior's return to the earth. The thought of his coming stirs my soul. It will be breathtaking. The scope and grandeur, the vastness and magnificence will exceed anything mortal eyes have ever seen or experienced. In that day, he will not come wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger, but he will appear in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory with all the holy angels. We will hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the sun and the moon will be transformed and stars will be hurled from their places. You and I or those who follow us, the saints from every quarter of the earth shall be quickened and caught up to meet him. And those who have died in righteousness, they too will be, taught, will be caught up to meet him in the midst of heaven. Then a seemingly impossible experience. All flesh, the Lord says, shall see me together. How will it happen? We do not know. But I testify it will happen exactly as prophesied. We will kneel in reverence, and the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. It shall be as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. Then the Lord, the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people. There will be unforgettable reunions with the angels of heaven and the saints upon the earth. But most important, as Isaiah declares, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God and he shall reign over all flesh. In that day the skeptics will be silent, for every ear shall hear, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess 
that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and the Savior and Redeemer of the world. Close quote. Oh, it's amazing. That's, that's exciting. This will be unlike anything this world has ever seen. The Savior will appear in clouds of glory. Those who have died and are to take part in the first resurrection will be reunited with their bodies. The graves will be opened. I can only imagine what that would be like to, to witness. Then the righteous, those who are still alive, as well as those who have been resurrected, will ascend into the clouds with the Savior and then descend upon the new earth with him. The earth will be cleansed by fire or the glory of Christ's presence. And all things celestial will be burned and removed from the earth. The Savior's return to the earth will usher in the millennium, which is a thousand year period of time in which Christ will rule and reign over the earth. Section 45 again of the Doctr Doctrine and Covenants says this in verse 56 uh, through 59. And at that day when I shall come in my glory, shall the parable be fulfilled which I spake concerning the ten virgins. For they that are wise and have received the truth and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. And the earth shall be given unto them for an inheritance, and they shall multiply and wax strong, and their children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. For the Lord shall be in their midst, and his glory shall be upon them, and he will be their king and their lawgiver. Honestly, I get a little frustrated uh, with the diagrams that we've all seen of the plan of salvation uh, in various lessons uh, in the church. Um, there are usually orbs representing the spirit world and earth life and the kingdoms of glory, but I never see anything representing the millennium. When the Lord refers to the next life or the life to come, he's probably referring to the millennium versus, uh, you know, after final judgment and, and kingdoms of glory. So the, the millennium, that period, that's the next life. Each of God's children will, will have some, ty some, some type of millennial experience. We always want to jump ahead to, to judgment and to kingdoms of glory, uh, but there won't be any kingdoms of glory until the end of the millennium when the earth passes away and is resurrected and becomes a celestial world, then Christ will inherit it and share it, his inheritance with, uh, with the faithful and the righteous. And, and he will dwell with his people who are also celestial. Um, President Joseph Fielding Smith taught this quote, when the reign of Jesus Christ comes during the millennium, only those who have lived the celestial law will be removed. The earth will be cleansed of all its corruption and wickedness. Those who have lived virtuous lives, who have been honest in their dealings with their fellow man and have endeavored to do good to the best of their understanding shall remain. Uh, so I mentioned that Christ would dwell with those who are celestial and that's accurate, but that won't be all that's on the earth. Uh, as President Smith just uh, in that last quote said, um, only the only those who lived a telestial law will be removed from the earth and cleansed by fire uh, and and a telestial or excuse me a, a a terrestrial person as well as celestial would be able to remain upon the earth um, president joseph fielding smith also taught this quote when the millennium is ushered in is ushered in the earth is to pass through a cleansing this will not be the final cleansing when the earth shall be consumed and pass away to be renewed again a celestial globe, but it will be the end of unrighteousness. All who have lived the celestial law, that is those who are unclean, they who are liars and sorcerers and whoremongers and whosoever loves and makes a lie and who suffer the wrath of God on earth and suffer the vengeance of eternal fire shall be swept off from the face of the earth. All of these will be cast down to hell where they shall remain until Christ shall have subdued all enemies under his feet and shall have perf perfected his work. During the thousand years, all these will be in this torment of mind, having ample time to reflect over their misdeeds and receive training in obedience to law so that they may be prepared to come forth in the resurrection at the end of the world. It will be impossible for the people of this class to remain on the earth during the millennium, for they would be as much out of their element as a fish out of water. 
the changed condition of the earth, which will be of a terrestrial order during this thousand years, will be suited to the capacity of those of the terrestrial world, as well as those who have kept the celestial law, and they shall have part in the first resurrection. And then shall the heathen nations be redeemed, and they that knew no law shall have part in the first resurrection, and it shall be tolerable for them. That's section 45, verse 54. But with those of the celestial order, this will not be so. These are they who are as stubble who shall be consumed when Christ comes, according to the words of Malachi. It is, it is of this class the Lord speaks when he says, For the hour is nigh and the day soon at hand when the earth is ripe, and all the proud and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble, and I will burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that wickedness shall not be upon the earth. For the hour is nigh, and that which was spoken by mine apostles must be fulfilled. For as they spoke, so shall it come to pass. For I will reveal myself from heaven with power and great glory, with all the hosts host thereof, and dwell in righteousness with men on earth a thousand years, and the wicked shall not stand. That's the end of the quote. And President Smith there was, was quoting Doctrine and Covenants 29, 9 through 11. So when the millennium begins, Satan and his minions will be bound and have no power over the inhabitants of the earth. It will be a, a period of peace and of order. Uh, another amazing thing will occur. The ancient city of Enoch, which was translated and taken off of and, and away from the earth, will return to it. The Latter-day Saints will have built a modern Zion, the New Jerusalem that we talked about before, equal in righteousness to Enoch's Zion. The two cities will become one as the ancient Zion descends from wherever it is, and the new Zion ascends from, from the earth, and then they are, are joined together and uh, on, on the earth and become as one. Um, this is uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 84, verse 100. The Lord hath redeemed his people, and Satan is bound, and time is no longer. The Lord hath gathered all things in one. The Lord hath brought down Zion from above. The Lord hath brought up Zion from beneath. And then Moses 7, 63 and 64. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou and all thy city meet them there. Referring to the New Jerusalem uh, people and the Zion there. And we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us. And we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. And for the space of a thousand years, of, uh, of a thousand years the earth shall rest. What, what an amazing reunion that will be. Uh, it's touching to, to imagine, and it's exciting at the same time. Um, but I, I love the description of that. Um, of that. And I call it a reunion because um, there it will be an association of people who have, have known each other in the spirit world, but, but separated by thousands of years um, on the earth, but, but a Zion society uh, together. So I, I think that's just a beautiful thing. Um, one more, this is the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter nine, starting in verse 21. And the bow, meaning the rainbow, shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy." And the general assembly and the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth and shall have place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. Now this, this is what I'm describing. This is what our living prophet is pleading with us to prepare for, to prepare ourselves and to prepare the world uh, for this eventuality. Now, whether we are alive when the Savior comes or whether we've passed on, this event will be the greatest thing that will have ever happened to us. If we've been faithful and, and passed from mortality, we'll be resurrected and caught up in the cloud 
to, uh, to be with the Savior. If we're alive when he comes, we'll also be caught up to meet him. Um, and it will be one great host of, of and, and it will be as angels uh, and descend with, with the Savior upon the earth and dwell with him. Um, we, with, with our loved ones who are, are living or dead, we can rejoice together and worship our Savior, our King, our lawgiver in his very presence. We'll live without opposition from Satan. Our children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren will multiply and wax strong, and their children shall grow up without sin unto salvation, as we read in section 45 earlier. The children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. That's a beautiful thing. The prophet Isaiah described the millennium as a time when enmity or hostility between men and between animals and between men and animals uh, will cease. I don't know if that made sense, but uh, between animals and between men and between men and animals. Um, he said this, this is Isaiah 11, starting in verse six, or excuse me. Yeah, Isaiah 11, verse six. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Lord has commanded all of his prophets throughout the whole history of the earth to prophesy of, of this time. And I, I don't have the, the direct quote, but, uh, but President Nelson has observed that all of the prophets and all of the saints throughout history have, have looked upon this time and have prophesied of it. But we are the generation uh, who will experience it and who are um, in effect on the field during the game uh, versus those who are on, on the sidelines observing. Um, and that is um, is humbling to me, uh, whether whether I'm uh, alive or or deceased and and resurrected. Uh, either way, um, just to be alive now at the time preceding uh, this event is uh, is just amazing and 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 humbling. Like I said, um, but the Lord has repeatedly commanded us to watch and to prepare. And we can do this by learning the signs of his coming and, and being aware of what's happening in the world around us. And I've only touched on a few of, of the signs. I've talked about the preliminary appearances, but not a lot about, um, about the signs of the times. And um, I encourage you to, uh, to study those and to, to know those, um, to read the book of Revelation and to read Isaiah. You can't skip over Isaiah. Um, I know it's in, they're in Second Nephi, and it's tough uh, to understand. But there are are tools and books and and people who understand the symbols and the and the culture of ancient Israel uh, who can help you understand. And it's worth it. It's worth the work uh, to understand, so you can so you can know the beautiful uh, prophecies and um, and the signs of the times, and be able to uh, to know what to look for. Um, and the Doctrine and Covenants is, is fantastic at, uh, um, at giving those signs. The Lord gives many of those signs and, and, and descriptions of the last days. Um, so we, we need to know those and, and watch for those. Uh, but we need to, to fill our spiritual vessels with oil like the five wise virgins. Um, and we do that by keeping our covenants and by drawing continually closer to the Savior. Um, and there's, there have been, uh, some great general conference talks from general authorities talking about, uh, how to, um, how to have extra oil and what kind of things to do. Um, but ultimately it is coming to know our savior and being bound to him and, and, and having a relationship with him, um, that, that will be the best 
the best preparation. When we hear him and know him uh, and begin to become like him, uh, then we will be prepared to meet him. When we can imagine a reunion with our Savior um, and and not be uh, and not be afraid or or full of dread at that idea, but but full of of joy and anticipation at at that thought, um, at the thought of of kneeling at his feet and and kissing his feet and and being brought to our feet, our feet and and stand before him and to look into his eyes and feel the love, the overwhelming love uh, and, and knowledge that of, of him knowing us so intimately and so personally. Um, when we crave this kind of reunion, I think we are, um, are becoming prepared or at least somewhat prepared um, for that to, to happen. Um, but we, and, and I'm reminded every day uh, that we face extreme oppositions in, opposition in these last days. Um, like we've mentioned in other podcasts that the adversary is quadrupling his efforts and arming his minions with potent weapons. Those are the words of, of our living prophet. And so we need to be aware of those things too and, and not become distracted and one of the adversary's most effective tools in these last days is distraction. And I'm going to tell you that as we, in, in the coming months and years, uh, we will see um, amazing technologies and things that will, uh, that will be designed to distract you and I uh, from, from the Lord and from, and from doing these things that, that we just discussed from these preparations, uh, there will be very enticing things that will, uh, that will distract us, uh, from, from doing good and from, uh, from studying the scriptures and from even thinking about, uh, about the savior and about sacred things. And we have to avoid these things and we have to overcome these things and the Lord will help us to do that. Um, but I testify to you with all of my soul, that these prophecies are true, that our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, will return to this earth in the clouds of glory exactly as prophesied. And I hope that you and I will be among those who will meet him in the clouds and who will descend upon the earth and inherit it with him and live in, in the peaceful millennial day uh, a thousand years. And I leave this with you in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.